All right, now we kind of switch gears again. There are um, four types of economies, all right? Uh, usually we just talk about three, but there's a fourth one that's mixed, and that's pretty much where we all are. The first one is a market economy. The second one is a traditional economy, and the third one is a command economy. Now, these are models. There is no economy in the world that is purely market or purely traditional or uh, purely command. Uh, I'll, I'll say that, but there might be a few out there that are very command. Um, we are an example of a market economy. Now, we're not a pure market economy. That's what we call it a model. Remember, models are simplified versions of something more complex. And in econ, we use those to help us understand items that are more complex. So we're going to talk about these. And we have, and most countries do, have symptoms or um, characteristics of all three of these in their economy. But they are more dominated by one. Okay, we are generally considered a market economy, and there are countries in the world that are more free market than we are. Um, not very many, but there are certainly a few. Singapore is usually considered the most free country in the world, along with Hong Kong, which is a part of China, but it's, it's a separate... It's separate unto itself, and there just about anything goes. The government has very, very, very little um, influence on rules and laws, even less than we do here in the United States. Some of you may feel like we have a lot. Well, compared to most countries in the world, we have very, very few rules restricting what you can do here in our country. And here we see a couple of political um, posters that uh, are uh, old critical of capitalism, some of the negativities to it. The one on the left there says capitalism, bringing you lower quality and fewer choices since the 16th century. Um, that there is uh, saying that, you know, big businesses pollute the air, um, put out cheap products, things like that. Um, that the big boy, like Microsoft, is going to run out competitors, um, so the fewer choices. And then on the right, capitalism. Without it, how would we ever have the time and leisure we need to organize protest against it? Um, so, you know, capitalism gives us freedom to choose what we want to do with our with our lives, what businesses we want to own, what, uh, what products we want to buy, uh, those types of items. Whereas in a more communist country, we wouldn't have the choices, we wouldn't have the opportunities that we do. Um, so this is always a struggle, you know, how, how free is too free? At what point does our freedom actually harm us in the long run? All right, Adam Smith, and, and this one's going to take a little bit. Adam Smith is uh, what we call the father of modern economics. Um, he championed a, a term called laissez-faire, which is uh, French for hands-off or um, let the government, let the people be, let it be. And he was a big advocate for the government taking a lesser role in the lives of the people and basically smaller government. Back in 1776, he wrote a book called An Inquiry into the Wealth of Nations. Usually we just call that the Wealth of Nations is, is usually how economists will refer to that book. Now, anytime we're talking about a book that was written 240 years ago, 250 years ago, um, that's pretty significant. But we don't do that very often. It, it means that there are a lot of people that think he was correct in some of the theories that he had thrown out in this book. And this was a time when the government, when most people felt like the government had to make all the important decisions. It was, it was the government's job to really make the decisions for the people. As an example, if, if a community or a society or a town had a valuable resource, let's say it's a, a bunch of trees, well, a, a forest, well, the people would look to the government to decide what to do with that forest. Well, Adam Smith said, you're wrong. Need, that is absolutely wrong. You need to let those trees be owned by the people, by an individual person or by uh, a group of five people individually. And he would say that in competition, individual ambition serves the common good. What he would argue is if I own 30 of those trees, I would do what's best for me. And in me doing what's best for myself would also be good for the people. As an example, let's say I own those 30 trees and I had a guy who wanted to build boats. Uh, come and offer me some money for those trees, and a guy who builds houses come and offer me money for those for those trees. Well, if there was a housing shortage, which one of those two guys would offer me the most money? Well, it would be the housing guy, you would think, because he would be able to turn around and, and turn a profit with those trees more so than the guy who builds boats. So therefore, the house builder would offer me the most money. So 
my individual ambition would cause me to sell those trees to the home builder. And as a result, the community would end up with more houses. Therefore, my individual ambition would end up in, the, in, in more good for the whole community. Um, the, uh, you can see a couple of uh, cartoons around here, or a couple of uh, cartoons and things like that. you got a lounge, they have a laissez-faire lounge, just kind of laid back, um, kind of impression, right? Um, nobody's going to be telling you what to do or whatever, just kind of a chill place. Um, and then you've got the other two there. So that's Adam Smith. All right, and then the uh, second society after or economy, after market economy, is what's called a traditional Economy. These are economies that live much today the same way they did two or three hundred years ago. Um, maybe they're tribes in Africa. The one I have a picture of here is what's called an Inuit society in Canada. Now they have started to accept um, outside interaction a little bit more. You can see these coats were obviously not made by uh, by somebody in, in, in another country or whatever. The, or they were made by somebody in another country. These were obviously not made by the Eskimos using the you know, the whale and walrus furs and all that kind of stuff. But uh, for the most part, they like to keep to themselves. They, they live in igloos. They live in the northern parts of Canada for the most part. Um, they're very, very traditional. They are so traditional that when the men go out on a hunt, and it's only the men, go out on a hunt and they kill a polar bear. Well, if there's 18 families in the village, they are going to divide that polar bear up into 18 um, pieces of meat. And the first or the best piece of meat doesn't go to the king. It doesn't go to the most elderly person. It goes to the person who is most responsible for the kill of the bear. The second piece of meat goes to the second most responsible. Third piece of meat, third most responsible. Well, who gets the worst piece of meat? Well, it's the women or the elderly at home, you know, the elderly who can't go out and hunt, or the women who don't have a husband to go out on the hunt. Well, you may, here in the United States, we treat are elderly very different. We give them health insurance. We give them Medicare. We give them a social security check. That is not the case in the Inuit society because it's it's tradition. And traditionally, that's how things work. But it also makes sense in a way. You want to keep your strongest, healthiest hunters healthy to keep going out to kill and to hunt and provide for the village. So tradition there is very, very different. And tradition is what rules what to produce, how to produce it, and who gets it. So very, very different um, than what we have here. All right, and then the last one is a command economy. A command economy is a little bit easier for us to visualize uh, with a uh, with a communist country, extreme communist country. Cuba, North Korea. North Korea would be uh, one of these uh, countries that uh, would probably be.